grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I think today's topic lives up to its billing as a tough topic as we tackle the issue of racism. Now, now racism is probably one of the more emotionally charged words out there currently, and probably everybody out there feels a particular way when we hear that word. And I think, in fact, it would probably be helpful to think about for a minute, what do you feel? What, not what are you thinking, or, you know, but what are you feeling when you hear the word racism? There's probably a lot of different ranges of emotions from all different uh, uh, sides of the, the equation. Um, and I think it's good to recognize those emotions because the goal of our sermon series is for all these topics is to help us filter through these issues through a, a Christ and word-centered lens. And it's probably helpful to recognize our emotions because that way we can kind of uh, process them or, or work through them instead of letting them control us because we don't want our emotions to control us. We don't want any other agenda to control us. What we really want is Christ to control us and guide us. Um, thankfully, uh, when we're alongside dealing with racism, the Christian reality of reconciliation provides us a way through, through conflict, hurt, disagreement, and sin. Now, I think reconciliation would be great for America if we could, you know, obviously everybody not seeing things the same way. I'd like to see it happen. I'd like to help in ways that I can, but that's really not our job or our focus today. And frankly, I'm not up to the task of reconciling or trying to reconcile America. Um, uh, oh, I don't know what happened there. I don't know what to, oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, however, um, the promise is that those who follow Christ, for Christians, we can. In fact, it's not we can. We will be reconciled to each other. For Christians, reconciliation is absolutely inseparable from being in Christ. I mean, after all, we would be enemies of God if we had not been reconciled to God through Christ and the cross. And the scriptures say we won't stay in Christ if we refuse to reconcile with brothers or sisters in Christ. Um, now, the, uh, the dictionary definition of reconciliation is the restoration of friendly relationships. It's helpful, I think, to think of reconcil Christian reconciliation in particular as including three parts, and they're going to sound pretty familiar. First, we confess our sins. Second, we receive and give forgiveness. And third, we work together and move forward in Christ. Now, as I said, it's, it's a, a bit risky, I think, <laughs> to talk about such a thorny and emotionally charged topic as racism these days, but I'm going to make kind of the same argument about why as I've done with other things. People are going to talk about it. I mean, I practically guarantee you that younger generations are not going to stop talking about it, but if anything, talk more about it. People will be talking about it. The question is, will we? And, of course, what should we say? And perhaps most importantly, who will we trust to teach us how to respond? Well, how about Jesus? This is really, if we, we can think about it in different ways, this is another chance to talk with people about Jesus. I think that the kinds of issues that people really care about and are, are passionate about, uh, which obviously lots of folks are, and I don't think it's just going to stop. It wasn't just a flash in the pan. People are continuing, going to continue to talk about it and debate it. Um, but when people are passionate about something, it's a way to engage in a conversation with them. And uh, it's a way to show that the Christian faith is, is not just a matter of belief. Uh, it's not just a philosophical assertions, 
but that Jesus and the God's kingdom provide an answer to these tough questions. And when we can answer them in, in a way that is faithful to Jesus, it can communicate uh, to people that we care and that we're trying to do something, even if it maybe isn't exactly the solution that, that they are currently subscribing to. But the fact, if we can communicate that we care and we're working towards, or we're looking to make things better and we're willing to work towards it in a, in a Christ-centered way, in a way that puts the focus on Christ, then it really might open, gos- uh, it might open ears and eyes for people to hear the gospel. Um, remember, uh, as we said, and the first step is confessing sins. And uh, certainly I don't know what everybody's sins are, but we do know we've all sinned in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. That's pretty familiar ground for Lutherans, right? And I suspect that we have not loved including our neighbors who may look or sound different than we do as ourselves at times. We know that we have not loved God with our whole heart. It shouldn't be too difficult if we actually can be honest and think about it that we probably have sins to confess. We do in every other arena of life. I'm sure we do in this arena as well. But just as important as confessing sins is uh, forgiveness, which is that, that second step of reconciliation. It's, it starts or started, we could say, when we were made right with God through Christ's forgiveness offered to us freely without charge at, uh, in our baptism through Christ. We deserve, we know, we recognize to be punished, but we live by God's grace, not by our perfection or even by our goodness. No, rather we've been washed clean and experienced God's grace and We want others to receive it as well. Just as important, we offer forgiveness too, because we have not only sinned, but we have been sinned against. Now, some may certainly have been sinned against more than others, but still, at the end of the day, Christ calls us to forgive. He doesn't ask us how big the sin is or how much pain. He calls us to forgive and freedom through forgiveness in the cross. Jesus endured the cross and scorned its shame and all the public humiliation, the beatings, the injustice, even the death, because he came to offer us forgiveness and salvation. And even if nothing else could motivate us to forgive others or to confess our sins, well then the cross and the Holy Spirit can. Now, now having said that, anytime any group has disagreements or whenever Christians have dif- disagreements, Certainly the specific details have to be addressed. And uh, like I said, I don't know if it's within the scope of this sermon to discuss all that. Um, But here's an example from the early church where something uh, similar happened, where there was, where there was, there, in the early Christian church, there were Greeks, uh, there were Gentile converts, and there were the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. And early on, some of the Greek widows were not being cared for. Uh, they, while the Jewish widows were, so there were some discrepancies. Some of the Grecian Christians, or the Hellenistic, depending on, uh, it basically means Gentile Christians, they brought a complaint forward because the fact was the widows of their community were being overlooked and, and they were being passed over in food distribution. And so the church had to do something. Uh, the church that led to seven deacons, including Stephen, um, being called, because something was wrong, and so the church got together and decided to, to do something about it. Um, I think that's a, a great example of the church coming together, being uh, finding problems and uh, not digging in, but rather working together to find a solution. And that's certainly what um, the church can be a great example of. Instead of just everybody digging in on their side and launching Uh, you know, word grenades at each other across lines. Instead, we find a way to come together. Uh, Again, I know that sounds like a tough task, but it's made possible because uh, of Christ. Um, There's there's a lot of takes, I know, again, the word race, and there's a lot of takes on racism out there. And I think one thing that's very clear is that 
racism is unequivocally uh, condemned in the, New in the scriptures, and particularly in the New Testament. Um, but there's different takes on whether there's racism in America, and I don't know if it's the most important question. I personally think that there is still issues that, that uh, n there's negative um, roles uh, that are still affected by these things in our history. Uh, my opinion is that it, it still has a, a negative effect. Um, but I also know Christians who I respect who see it very differently. But no matter what we believe, uh, we should certainly respect one another. And, and our Christian values don't change no matter what we believe about a particular topic or another. And I also think Lutherans have a great uh, long history of not relying on force, um, but upon the power of the Word and the Holy Spirit to convince and change hearts. And we rely upon God to take an active role in fixing things. Um, you know, the way that we disagree can often communicate uh, to others that we care about them and the relationship. Or it can also, on the other hand, show that their experiences or opinions don't really matter to us. Um, we can, we're, even when we're disagreeing, there's, you know, right, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And once again, for me, when I think about that, I'm reminded that I need forgiveness because I don't always handle it um, the right way. Uh, but regardless of what someone is saying, uh, respectfully listening and, and respectfully communicating can sure go a long way, right? Even if no one changes their perspective or opinion, uh, we, can at least, we can at least shoot for respect um, in our, our conversations. And I think there's something that we can learn about our, our posture. This, this relates to all of any kind of attitude or any kind of tough topic. Um, but there's a right sort of posture uh, to adopt. You know, there's, there's posture is the way you're, you know, maybe standing or the way you're approaching something. In sports, the wrong posture would be to be lying on the ground. That's not the right way. You're, when you're at work, the wrong posture would be like sleeping on your desk. That's not the right way you should be at work, I don't think, unless you're doing a sleep study or something. Um, but uh, the, right po the wrong posture for Christians is to be responding uh, to, uh, from pride or hatred or bitterness. Uh, we're told in the New Testament that we should be self-controlled, uh, and we should certainly not be controlled by anger, rage, or bitterness. Again, you can certainly see it on, all over, uh, on every side of every topic. Um, but reacting out of hate or wrath, I mean, that rarely, right? That really rarely ever leads to a very Christ-like response. It rarely makes things better. It often makes um, them worse. Now, you might be angry. I'm not, I'm not trying to say you can't, you can't be angry. Perhaps you're angry for a very good reason. But it's unwise and, and certainly not faithful to Christ to let our anger control our response. Um, on the other hand, the right posture for a Christian is a posture of humility. When, you know, when we're talking about differences or, uh, or grievances, when someone you love, when a brother or a sister in Christ is truly bothered by something, we should, should at least hear them out. And we want our response to come from a place of love. Now, Christian love, it's not just an emotion, but rather it's, it's defined by Christ. It's the cross-bearing, others-centered love given and exemplified by our Savior. Um, uh, behind. Uh, in, in the... Um, the New Testament, pretty much any and every difference takes a back seat to the most important thing that unifies us, Jesus, who unites us through baptism into his name. Um, his is the name above all names. Everyone, we're told, who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter was sort of shocked when he uh, came to that realization in our epistle, our second reading, uh, but it's, it's the, the truth. It's by being included in Jesus' name by being members of the body of Christ, that, that we are God's people. In other words, being a Christian is more important, or being in Christ is more important than any other identity that you and I hold. In our reading from Isaiah chapter 42, we see already in the Old Testament a, a prophesied servant of the Lord who has come, it tells us, to bring justice. 
as well as light for the nations. He comes to free the prisoners uh, and to, to set captives free. Justice has, and justice always will, matter to Yahweh. We can see this so many times. He despises injustice, which is in part why the world must be remade. It's in its present form, it's never going to be com- completely fixed. Things are, there's always going to be wrong. There's always going to be injustice, pain, and hurt. But it's important to note that Yahweh's attitude is never in the scriptures one of resignation or indifference to injustice out there. And that's one major reason why he sends uh, his servants, like prophets or judges. You see, they come to address injustice as well as to proclaim uh, God's word. But those prophets, they, they, they help, but whenever they come, they really only help for, for a short time. You know, just read a couple chapters after they're gone, and you'll always run into more problems. But Isaiah chapter 42, and, and all of Isaiah's, the latter cha- section of Isaiah, prophesies a permanent fix. The famous servant songs of Isaiah And there's a servant that the Lord talks about. This servant, though, is a little different, um, or a lot different, than some of the other servants that Yahweh sent in the past. Uh, Some things are the same. For instance, this servant will glorify Yahweh's holy name. But when this servant comes, no longer will God's people serve idols. But the whole world, in fact, will sing a new song to the Lord. And, of course, you know, fast-tracking us, we know this servant was Jesus. And that now, because of him, we live in this new era, a new testament with new rules and a new people of God. This new era began in earnest following Jesus' ascension and the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. But it's still, they don't quite get everything right away. In fact, in Acts chapter 10, Peter is being repeatedly prodded and poked by the Holy Spirit to go visit a Roman centurion, Cornelius, even though this would make Peter unclean. And uh, he was a Roman centurion, a a member of the military of the occupying force. A Roman centurion, remember there was a Roman centurion standing at the cross of Jesus. There would undoubtedly be probably, uh, certainly Roman soldiers and perhaps a Roman centurion standing at the foot of Peter's cross when he's crucified upside down. It's, It's hard not to... It's, it's easy to sympathize why Peter wouldn't get this right away. But after arriving and after hearing from Cornelius and the Holy Spirit, Peter has a bit of an epiphany saying, ah, okay, it's sinking in a little bit now. God doesn't just want to save the Jews. Rather, Jesus came to offer forgiveness and salvation to any who trust on him. It really actually meant all when it said, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, it's Peter's learning the same point that we have to be retaught. It's not just about us in this building. The gospel is about and for all people. And um, I'm convinced one one of the biggest reasons why there's problems in the church, and again, this I think applies to a lot of different things, but it could include this particular issue, um, why there's so much tension and strife in the church. One reason is that different groups often don't get together and talk. It's, you know, it's easier that way when we just stick it with the group that we're used to sticking with. Um, but, but the problem is when we don't talk, things often get worse. They don't get better. Um, time heals all wounds. That's, uh, in some cases, very debatable. Uh, when people don't talk, things often don't get any better. And, um, and when we're hurt, too, right? We're, we're even less likely to talk to people when, when we're hurt, which, again, though, the problem is that it compounds the issue. Uh, however, the good news uh, of Christ can change any and all things. And, and in fact, I'm committed, I'm optimistic that, that good, loving Christian folks such as yourself and others, you know, I really think that, if, that we can work things out, that, we can, that when we talk to fellow Christians, we can, we're capable of doing some of those steps of reconciliation, offering and giving forgiveness, confessing our sins, and, and finding new unity in Christ. But it's it's not going to happen, this is uh, like many things, it's, it's not going to happen unless we take um, those steps, unless we talk to people. They're, you know, reconciliation is impossible if people don't talk to one another. And so I guess, you know, forget everything else maybe, don't, but, you know, if you have to, uh, be on the, the lookout for whenever there's somebody who you're at odds with, 
looking for, for opportunities uh, where you can have respectful conversations, um, including about issues that you might think very differently about, because the only way you get, the only way those things can be resolved is if you start communicating. Um, um, well, one thing that is clear uh, that I also hope you get out of this message is that the church, the church is a place of reconciliation. I mean, and it's not really optional. It's, it's part of our DNA. It's part of our beginning. It's part of our future. I mean, after all, we're going to be worshiping together. We're going to be in eternity for forever. We might as well start getting along now, right? Uh, we're going to be stuck in the same room. Maybe not quite the same room, but we're going to be in the same new heavens, new earth together for a long time. So uh, might as well work on that relation, those relationships now. Um, the church isn't just here to worship. You know, Christ calls us to a variety of things, and one of those really important things is that we are to actively continue the reconciling work of Christ. It's, you know, Christ has reconciled us, but the work isn't over because there's so many opportunities where people need to be reconciled to Christ or where fellow Christians uh, can be reconciled to one another. And it's a, what an opportunity. That, that is our Christian calling. God's work, it may be tough, it may be hard, it may be uncomfortable at times, but when we can reconcile, then you can know for sure uh, that you are doing God's will, uh, that Christ is active, and that his work continues to this day. Um, you know, so I think the idea is, is hopefully we adopt and continue to work on an attitude that, that when there's injustice in the church, the aim is, is certainly to restore those who have been wronged, but also uh, that we learn to lean on and live out a, a new reality that's really only possible through Jesus. Um, and if you don't me, believe me about this reconciliation business, listen to the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we hear that we are something new. We're a new creation. It's not the old way. It's not, we're not living according to the old rules or according to the old systems. We're a new creation. We have been reconciled, and we have been called to be agents of reconciliation. In fact, uh, reconciliation is one of the, the prime golden opportunities for the church to be the church, through reconciling sinners to one another and to God through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.